Can we bring the lights down a bit? Bring the lights down a bit. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Remy. Thanks. Uh, it is actually a real pleasure and honor to be speaking at Full Frontal. I have, I'm not a lifer. I didn't make it to every single one, but I was here at the first one. Also, I love this venue, the Duke of York's. It means a lot to me. And having Full Frontal in the Duke of York's, my idea. My <laughs> idea. Five years ago. Hmm? Uh, no, it's good. It's good. Anyway, um, so I am now uh, the only thing standing between you and getting out there and getting some food. So I'm going to begin with some food. Um, <laughs> Can anybody tell me where this is? Duke Yorks. No. Can anyone? Australia. No. Oh. Well, who said Chicago? It's correct. This is Chicago. Now, there's two things that might give it away that this is Chicago. One is the skyline of Chicago, which is amazing. <laughs> um, you know, it's home of the skyscraper. It's a beautiful thing to behold. Every time I see the skyline, it's wonderful. And the second is the Chicago dog, the best of all hot dogs. Uh, I took this picture a while back when I was in Chicago, I think, for the first time. And I was back in Chicago recently. And as well as being the home of an amazing skyline and an amazing hot dog, Chicago is also the starting point of a fantastic film, a short film that was, made, uh, was commissioned by IBM in the late 60s, uh, and it was made by Charles and Ray Eames. Audio. Part of a lazy afternoon, early 1 October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now, every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide. The distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. It's a wonderful film. It's called Powers of Ten. So the last time I was in Chicago, I thought, where exactly is that opening sequence from Powers of Ten? So I asked Twitter, of course. Like, help me, Twitter. Uh, and uh, Matthew Somerville came through and gave me latitude and longitude coordinates. So uh, I went there and sort of did a time-shifted uh, <laughs> recreation of the opening of Powers of Ten. And then I did what any normal person would do, and I made a spot on Foursquare so that you can also check into the location of Powers of Ten. Ten to the fourth meters, ten kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in ten seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole Great Lake. Ten to the fifth meters, the distance an orbiting satellite covers in ten seconds. Long parades of clouds, the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. A line extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. The speed of light, uh, 186, 284 uh, miles per second. So that's that, that distance we saw there. It was the distance that light travels in, in one second. Um, a unit we think about a lot uh, on the web when it comes to performance. Uh, seconds, we think, uh, obviously, less than seconds. Uh, performance, very important. So if the speed of light uh, is that distance um, that we saw, the physical distance uh, between the Earth and Moon, then theoretically to traverse, to do one circuit of the Earth, could take 67 milliseconds in, in, under perfect conditions. Um, that's the theoretical distance. Now, obviously, uh, light generally is traveling through some kind of medium. And on our network, the medium is, is uh, fiber optic cables. So in a cable, 90 milliseconds is, is the shortest amount of time it could take a signal to travel uh, the globe. Uh, because the, the network we are dealing with on our day-to-day -day work is very much a network of, of cables, fiber optic cables. You might like to think that the internet is all satellite transmission from space, but that is actually just a rounding error. Uh, our, our network is very, very physical. It's very, very real. It's, it's cables. Uh, this is a wonderful <coughs> cable map. Every year, there's a new cable map produced by a company called Tele Telegeography. 
Um, and you can order them as, as posters to put on your, your company wall, which will remind you that our network is very physical. It consists of physical things, physical cables. You will note here it bears absolutely no resemblance to a cloud. <laughs> so signals are traveling through fiber optic cables at varying speeds throughout this network, our network, the internet. Now, Somebody mapped, there was, a, there was a paper where they mapped where the, the fastest connections are in our network, our physical network of cables. And not surprisingly, a lot of those spots are, are where the backbones are, right? Where you'd expect, you know, the, the hubs, the, where, the, where the pipes come in out of the sea. Uh, this is in a paper called Planetary Scale Computing Architectures for Electronic Trading, because that's the key point here. Uh, it's not about human beings and how fast human beings can send signals. This is about the algorithms that use this network. And electronic trading uh, is very much run by algorithms. Human beings are just far, far too slow. The amount of time it takes for us to, to click a button, to make a decision, far too slow. So we have algorithms making most of the important financial decisions uh, every day in our life. Uh, so algorithms generally answer the important questions in life, like, will I get a mortgage? An algorithm is going to answer that. Uh, human beings are left to answer questions like, uh, would you like fries with that? <laughs> so with some of these locations, you'll see they're in the middle of the ocean, right? The, the, you could, if, you, if you had your server on that red spot in the middle of the ocean, you'd actually have a bit of a competitive advantage in terms of a couple of mini, milliseconds uh, when it comes to algorithmic trading. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see settlements at these points in the oceans, these points, uh, server settlements, uh, to take advantage of that speed. That might sound pretty far-fetched, that we would eff effectively terraform our planet uh, for the sake of algorithms and making, making uh, those connections faster. But it's already happening. This, uh, the address of this place is 111 8th Avenue, New York. It's a hotel. It's called Carrier Hotel. But it's not a hotel for human beings. This, this is a hotel for servers. Uh, it's right near where the backbone comes in into New York, so uh, all the major companies have got servers in this building because they can get that, that little bit of an edge. This would be prime real estate for humans, but it's more important that the algorithms uh, have access to this particular geographic location. So time here has become a valuable business commodity. Those few extra milliseconds really matter and they can give a business a competitive edge. But that's not a particularly new development, the idea of time as a competitive edge. This is uh, Ruth Belleville. She's known as the Greenwich Time Lady. Uh, she inherited a business from her parents. She's the woman who sold time. Time was literally her business. She would go to Greenwich, and she would set her clock by the time at Greenwich. And then she would go around to her client list. She had about 200 clients. And set their watches according to the time, so that they had correct time and they had a competitive advantage because of that. Why this mattered at all, why it mattered at all that you, you have the correct time at your particular business, was a relatively recent uh, uh, addition to business. And it all came about because of another network. It was because of the rail networks that the idea of a centralized time even became important. Before the rail networks, you had local time. There was the time in Brighton, there was the time in Bristol. They would be different times. It didn't matter, right? But as soon as you got train timetables, where a train's supposed to show up at a particular time uh, and leave at a particular time, then you needed to have the same time. Uh, so it caused a big change in how we think about time. And there was a lot of opposition. This happened in America as well. There was a lot of uh, clock smashing went on. The idea of the introduction of a, of a standardized time rather than local time. Uh, anyone from Brighton will recognize this, right? This is the, the Brighton Jubilee Clock Tower. It's one of the, the Jubilee clocks that sprung up all over the empire. And this is from 1888. It was designed by Magnus Folks, who's one of Brighton's uh, famous sort of steampunk creators. He did the electric railway down the seafront. Um, you, you'll notice it's got that, that yellow ball on the top, the golden ball. Now, currently, this doesn't operate. This, this, the ball doesn't operate, but it used to. The ball would rise up over the course of an hour and it was connected telegraphically to Greenwich. So on the hour, the ball would be released, and it would make an almighty noise, and you knew what time it was. Um, it got switched off for, for a couple of reasons. One, it was really loud, and the neighbors <laughs> complained. Uh, and two, it was destroying the structural integrity of the building. It was like having a very slow jackhammer just destroying the clock tower. 
Well, like I said, it was connected telegraphically to Greenwich, the, the, the prime meridian, right? The origin of where we, we set our clocks by. Um, and the reason why we use Greenwich, it sort of dates back to a different network. And, and this was the seafaring network. And they had a problem, and they put forward a prize. And this was the longitude prize, trying to figure out uh, which longitude you were on when you were traveling the seas. Basically, where am I? They're trying to answer that question, where am I? I'm on a boat, where am I? And what the longitude problem boils down to is a, a very simple sort of mathematical formula. It's not, it's not as complex as what Anna was showing. It's, it's much more simple algebraic uh, function here. So let's say that you've got three variables here. As long as you know two of them, you can figure out the third. So here are the three variables. The position of objects in the sky. This could be the sun, uh, it could be the moon, right? Uh, the time in a specific place on Earth, like say, Greenwich, and your position on the Earth. Now, as long as you have two of these variables, you can figure out the third. So to give you an example, um, those like star map apps on your iPhone, they know where you are, so they know your position on the Earth. They know what time it is, so they can then predict where objects will be in the sky. And that's how you get that lovely magical thing where it's bringing up the names of the constellations and, and, and planets, right? It's because they have two of those variables. Now, for the longitude prize, they only have one variable here, which is they can see objects in the sky. They can measure that. They're trying to figure out the position on the Earth. Where am I? What they need to know is what is the time in Greenwich, right? They need to fill in that variable. Um, so they tried various things. Um, they know the position of objects in the sky because they've got sextants, right? So they can look at the sun, they can look at the moon, they get their bearing by that. Trying to figure out the time, that's tougher because clocks at this time, most clocks, were pendulum clocks, and you can't really operate a pendulum clock on a ship, right? The rolling of the ocean is going to interfere with that. Um, also, there's sundials. Now, a sundial will work on a ship, but of course, a sundial is going to just tell you local time. It's going to give you the time on a ship, and it requires the sun to operate, but you know, you'd get that. By the way, if you've ever wondered why clocks go clockwise, it's simply because sundials were introduced in the northern hemisphere. Had the southern hemisphere been in the ascendant, then clockwise would go in the other direction. So anyway, they're trying to figure out the, the longitude prize, you know, because there's money up for grabs, trying various things to figure out what is the time in Greenwich. Things like a uh, weapon salve, it's called powder of sympathy. So the idea here was, uh, before you set sail on your voyage, you take a dog and you take a, a knife and you stab the dog with the knife. Then you put the dog on the ship and you keep the knife in Greenwich. And you've got to make sure that the dog's <laughs> wound is kept open on the ship, and meanwhile, back in Greenwich, on the hour, someone who can see the clock, heats the knife over a flame every hour, the theory being that there's some kind of sympathetic, spooky action at a distance between the knife and the dog, and the dog acts kind of like a, an alarm clock on your ship, and when the dog gets agitated, it means it's, uh, you know, the, the bells have just rung in Greenwich. It's a theory. Um, <laughs> you know, they applied the scientific method, it turned out not so good. So uh, eventually the problem was solved uh, by John Harrison, and he created the Harrison Watch. This is uh, age five. Um, and we have timekeeping, and we have accurate timekeeping, and now because of that we know where we are on the planet. So not only do, not only do we have timekeeping, we solved the longitude problem, we know where we are. And since then, our networks have just been getting faster and faster, and our accuracy has been getting faster and faster. But my point here is that our, our relationship with time has always had a connection to our networks and the speed of our networks. And as our networks got faster, our accuracy and our relationship with time had to get faster. So now today, with, with this fiber optic network that we use, our relationship with time is very, very fast when we do interact with it as opposed to the algorithms using the network. And I think we sometimes put a lot of emphasis on the real time, the here and now, the quick, quick connection, because it's awesome. This whole idea of the real time web uh, of instantaneous or near instantaneous connections across the planet is, is fantastic. But maybe we're neglecting the longer time scales. Um, Robin Sloan borrows some terms from economics to describe these kind of two levels of time. He calls them flow and stock. He says that uh, flow is the feed, it's the stream, uh, the daily and sub daily updates. And then stock is the durable stuff, what people discover via search. It's what spreads slowly but surely. And he says flow is in the ascendant these days, but we neglect the stock 
at our own peril. And of course, the, the, the flow, these fast connections, they can be a great source of stock, right? They, they over time, accumulate into this, this archive of real-time connections. Which is something that Matt Ogle talks about. He says, we've all been so distracted by the now that we've hardly noticed the beautiful comet tales of personal history trailing in our wake. Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the sun, followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That odd orbit belongs to Pluto. Not a planet, not a planet. <laughs> I'm just, sorry, suck it up, it's not a planet. I know a lot of people are very sentimental about Pluto, but take, to, uh, take trust from the fact that uh, Pluto was a planet for less than a year, a Plutonian year, that is. Brendan Eich created JavaScript in 10 days. I'm going to just leave that there. 100 days, one order of magnitude onwards. This figure is the average lifespan of a web page. Now, my data is a little out of date here. Uh, it would be interesting to run the, the numbers again, but last time that significant numbers were crunched, this came as the average lifespan of a web page. 100 days. Four years is the average lifespan of a Google product. Now, this was some work done by Charles Arthur at the Guardian. No, these are the numbers. I'll be accurate. It's not exactly four years. It's 1,459 days. But close as damn it, right? He took all of the Google products that have ever existed. He looked at how long they existed and averaged out how long they had to live. So Google Keep will be about, around for about four years. Um, he did this uh, when Google Reader was shut down. It was about the same time that Google Keep was released, I believe. You know, I think Google were kind of surprised that people weren't jumping on Google Keep the same week that they shut down Google Reader. <laughs> Strange that. Um, so bearing in mind that large corporations shut down sites all the time, it's hard to understand the excitement felt by smaller companies when they get sucked up by larger corporations, when they write blog posts that always begin with this, this kind of sentence. We're excited to announce that Wabi has teamed up with Google. Or... Uh, we're extremely excited to announce that Summify has been acquired by Twitter. We are super excited to announce that Jibe has been acquired by Yahoo. Today, we're excited to announce that Google has acquired Picnic. So we're excited to announce that we'll be making the journey to California to join Facebook. That was Gowala. <coughs> I still miss Gowala. Hey, everyone, I'm elated to tell you. Well, you found a different word than excited. I'm elated to tell you that Tumblr will be joining Yahoo. Let's see how that will work out. And more recently, I was reminded of this one. Today, we're thrilled to announce that Doppler has been acquired by Nokia. Um, <laughs> there, there's an issue here. <laughs> I think you, you'll agree in that. Um, their excitement, I don't share it. Um, <laughs> You know, that, you know that bit in The Office where Ricky Gervais is like, I've got good news and bad news, and you know, the bad news is you're all being fired, the good news is I got a promotion. And someone says, that's, that's bad news and irrelevant news, right? That's generally how these announcements go. It's bad news and irrelevant news. And the reason why is that there's a bit of a mismatch. If these companies had said from the start, hey, our plan is to you know, exist for a short time and then get swallowed up and shut down by a large corporation or you know, shut down at some future point, then maybe we would be a bit more careful about giving them our data, right? But they don't mention it at the time of sign-up. They don't say, you know, when you're inputting your data, you might want to make a backup because we make no guarantees that we're going to be around. There's some people are looking to maybe change the, the relationship. There's this great article on uh, Contents magazine um, about our data and what should happen to our data. A couple of simple rules. The first one being simply treat our data like it matters, right? You, you, your, your service would be nothing without our data. Uh, no upload without download. If you close the system, support data rescue, right? Fairly, fairly straightforward things. And some sites do do this, and, and that is good. But mainly, I just want the, the terms and conditions to be more of a two-way conversation between the user and the service that's asking for the, for the data. And when I say data, I mean your, your writings, your photos, your hopes, your dreams, your poetry, 
right? That maybe you should be able to ask questions like, what's going to happen to my data in the long term? How long are you going to hold on to it? Now, I mean, there are services that deliberately do short-term data storage. There's Snapchat, right? Very popular with people who don't understand how screen, share, uh, screen capture works. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Snook made a service called Femoral, where you blog and then that blog post disappears by design. Now, you might think I wouldn't like services like that because they're throwing away the data, but actually, at least they're honest about it. At least they're upfront. They tell you, we're not going to hold on to your data, we're going to throw it away, right? And you know when you sign up to use it, you can't be surprised when that picture gets deleted or that blog post gets deleted. That's the whole point of the service. So I'd just like to see more of a two-way conversation between <laughs> between these services to give us maybe just long term, like promises uh, for what they're going to do within the next year, promise for what they will do within the next five years, 10 years. Right? I know that's asking a lot, 10 years on the web. But to show that at least they're thinking about it, and not just, hey, we're really looking forward to getting bought up by Google or Yahoo or Flickr or Twitter or whatever it is, right? Mostly, I think, though, the main thing that we can do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is to call bullshit the next time somebody says this that the internet never forgets. There is no data to support this. If 100 days is the average lifespan of a web page, then where do we get the idea that the internet never forgets? And as Remy said, it's almost like this truism. You think, oh, I'll put it online, and now it's online. Problem solved. It's very, very dangerous. This idea that simply by going digital, you, you have preserved something. That's, that's, a, that's a big worry. I've seen it in other industries. In the film industry, there was a big movement to get films off celluloid and get them digitized, because celluloid is a volatile material, right? It burns. Um, but, and if you think, OK, I've digitized my film, problem solved. No. The problem's just beginning now. Now you have, to, you have the upkeep. You have to take care of that data. Things don't just stay you know, on a service somewhere without some work. You have to work at keeping data alive. You all know this. And yet, we find ourselves saying stuff like, oh, yeah, the internet never Be careful what you put on Google or Facebook, because it will be on there forever. I don't think Facebook gives a shit about you, you know, holding on to your data forever. So just call bullshit the next time someone says the internet never forgets. There are people who are helping. There's archive.org, of course, right? And they're doing wonderful work. One of the things that we say here all the time is bits in and bits out. And that is basically just an even shorter way of saying universal access to all knowledge. Well, do you go and put it into a cloud, which really means putting it in a corporate hand, some, somebody else that might turn it off at any moment, uh, like a Yahoo video that's already gone, Google video that's already gone, GeoCities that's already gone, YouTube, oh, isn't that going to last forever? It's like, I don't think so, Flickr, eh, not even. So uh, how do you go and try to give things away in a perpetual way? Access drives preservation. Access drives preservation, that's pretty key. That voice there was uh, Brewster Kale who runs the Internet Archive. He's kind of like the Bruce Wayne of the Internet. He got rich in the early days, and he spent his money well, you know, fighting the good fight to preserve the Internet. But of course, it's preserved at a different URL, preserved over at archive.org. So the fabric of the web is still torn apart when those sites shut down, shut down, right? It's great that the things are saved, but they're at a different URL, and cool URLs don't change, right? So maybe we should be considering not putting our data into these services, or let me put it another way, not only putting our data into these services. Uh, holding on to the canonical copy ourselves. This is the main idea behind the movement of uh, Indie Web Camp, which is dedicated to the radical idea that you should have your own website, uh, and that that's where you should post stuff. Now, it's not, it's not the idea isn't here that you just post stuff on your own website, and you hold on to it, and you don't let anyone have it. There's, there's another idea in digital preservation called locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. So the idea is you do want to distribute it. You do want to push it out to all these other services, and they provide great tools, right? but you want to hold on to the original copy. and You want the canonical URL to be at your own website. Of course, it's still very geeky, right? There's a small group of people getting together trying to solve this problem, and kind of like the survivalists in Montana hunkered down polishing our shotguns compared to you know, everyone out there just posting their stuff on Facebook and all these other services. Um, I will point out there's a huge opportunity here. If every other startup is asking people for their data, saying, give me your data, give me your data, give me your data, and nobody is enabling people to host their own data on their own websites. Now there's an opportunity for a startup, right? Maybe that's where we could be looking. Um, I've been posting on my own website for actually over 11 years now, um, blogging on adactio.com. It's up to me to make sure that data stays around. If it ever disappears, it should be my decision. 11 years is also the length of a wager. 
I have placed. That wager expires on the 22nd of February 2022. So um, I originally placed it in 2011. You can go to the website longbets.org slash 601. Longbets.org is this wonderful site where you can, well, you can begin by making a prediction. I predict by a certain date something will have happened or something will have not happened, right? Uh, contact with alien civilizations, uh, strong AI, singularity, whatever you want. And somebody else can challenge it and say, actually, I don't think that's true. And now it becomes a bet. And now you've got to put money down, right? You've got to put money down to make your prediction. You've got to put money down to make your bet. Uh, the money goes to charity. So uh, I have been called on this bet. Uh, and I have nominated a charity. Now, the, the bet states this. The original URL of this prediction will not exist in 11 years. <laughs> so it's kind of a meta bet. And I'm kind of thinking of it as a win-win situation. Because I'm really hoping I lose this bet. I'm really hoping that in 2022, this URL still exists. And I lose the bet. Uh, but, you know, if it doesn't exist, then hey, I've won. Although that probably means the organization doesn't exist and so there's no one around to pay up the money. Um, Matt Howie from Metafilter has taken me up on, the, on this particular challenge. So if he wins, the Computing History Museum in California gets the money. If I win, uh, Bletchley Park Foundation gets the money. So we'll see what happens in 2022. Uh, on that day, I, I propose that you know, we meet up for a drink here uh, to celebrate the win or, or loss of that bet. This is the Salon of Long. Now, it doesn't exist yet. It's only populated by render ghosts. But hopefully by 2022, it will exist. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year. Not yet out to the next star. Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. Now we think of uh, mountains as relatively stable things. Um, over a long enough geological time scale, that's not true. But still, very handy place to stick a time capsule. Uh, that's exactly what happened in 2010. Um, there's an organization, the Open Planets Foundation. The planet stands for Preservation and Long-Term Access Through Networked Services. And they placed a time capsule into Swiss Fort Knox in Zanen, in Switzerland. And when I say Swiss Fort Knox, I don't mean it's a place that's like Fort Knox in Switzerland. It's called Swiss Fort Knox. You can store your data there. It's awesome. It's like a James Bond villain's lair. This, this place is real. I mean, forget about storing my data in the cloud. I want to store my data in the mountain. <laughs> so what they put in the time capsule, uh, importantly, two things. There's, uh, Storage, there's formats, data formats, and storage media, mediums. Uh, so different formats stored in different mediums. The, the mediums are paper, microfilm, floppy disk, audio tape, CD, DVD, USB, and Blu-ray. Then the formats are the .move video file, the JPEG image format, PDF, Java, and HTML. Now, as for the, the storage mediums, I'm not sure which one of those are going to last. I'm betting magnetic media is not going to be great. Maybe I'll place, place my money on, on paper. Um, certainly, you know, Blu-ray, DVD, CD, I'm not sure we'll be able to decode that. Um, but of the formats, I'm actually pretty sure which one will still be readable at some future date. And I'd put my money on that last format, HTML. It's been around for 22 years. For, for, a, for a format, that, that's a long time. Of course, it hasn't stood still, right? It's evolved a lot. I think that's, that's kind, of a, kind of key to it. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of HTML because I'm a big fan of the web in general. You think about what, what the web is, 
You know, if the network is a very physical thing made up of, of fiber optic cables traversing the world, the web is completely insubstantial because it is nothing but, but protocols and formats. Uh, as Paul Downey put it, puts it, uh, the web is agreement, right? HTML, uh, URIs or URLs, and HTTP. Those things don't exist in the sense of something you can touch. They're purely agreements, right? We have to agree to use those formats for the web to exist. And of those three, three things, HTML is probably my favorite. Um, now, it's not the best format. Let me be clear. It's not like it's a perfect format. But I think that might even be its strength, the fact that it isn't perfect. We tried to create a perfect format. It was XHTML2. That didn't work out so well, right? It's not perfect, but it is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. That's its strength. Low barrier to entry, also a, a big strength. Uh, it changes over time, as I said, but what we need to avoid is that kind of year zero thinking that happened with XHTML2, where we think, it's not good enough, let's rip it out and start from scratch. That's almost always a bad idea when it comes to any kind of format or protocol or any kind of agreement, because it's very hard to change behavior. It's very hard to change systems that are already in place, even if they're not the best systems. I mean, think of time itself when we use 60 seconds in the hour, right? 60, or 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in the hour. Why 60? It doesn't seem to make much sense. It, it goes back to the Babylonians. They settled on this uh, base 60 uh, sexagesimal system because 60 was the first number that could be evenly divided by the first six numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. It made it handy for counting purposes, and so we got stuck with base 60 timekeeping. And a whole 12-hour and 24-hour day, that was the Egyptians. You know, we could change this at any time, theoretically. It would be really, really hard. People have tried. After the French Revolution, there was the idea of decimal time. It would make a lot more logical sense to have 100 minutes and 10 hours, right? But it's really hard to change behavior. It's hard to change entrenched things. The fact that the prime meridium is at Greenwich goes back to British naval superiority a few centuries ago, right? There's no reason why it needs to be that particular place. So HTML is not the best format. But it may just be uh, the, the longest lasting format because of its ubiquity, because it's taken off so much at this point. As Mark Pilgrim wrote, HTML is not an output format. HTML is the format, not the format of forever, but damn it if it isn't the format of the now. You can't read this online at the moment. It's 410 gone because Mark Pilgrim took it offline. But at least Mark Pilgrim <coughs> made that decision to take it offline. It wasn't made by a third party person. The longevity of HTML isn't an accident. It's, it's there by design. Uh, Ian Hickson, who's the, the editor of the HTML spec at the WG, he wrote this a few years back in a mailing list, I decided that the sake for, for the sake of future generations, we should document exactly how to process today's documents so that when they look back, they can still re-implement HTML browsers and get our data back. Right? Actual long-term thinking when it comes to something quite short-term, right? We think of HTML in, in terms of the new shiny. But in order to push it forwards into the future, we really need to bear in mind backwards compatibility. It's, it has to be baked in. Uh, I'm fond of saying that the best way to be future friendly is to be backwards compatible. Um, and one of the strengths of HTML, of course, is it's very liberal error handling. And some people see this as a weakness, right? That if I make a mistake in my HTML, the browser doesn't shout at me, doesn't give me an error, it just accepts it, ignores what it doesn't understand, and carries on. Right? Very forgiving. Um, unlike JavaScript. Now, JavaScript has to you know, throw in there. It's a programming language. It can't be that forgiving. I mean, as programming languages go, it's pretty forgiving. But it's not as forgiving as something like uh, HTML, or even CSS, for that matter, where you can you know, write gobbledygook and you won't throw an error in a browser. That, that kind of error handling is important because it allows us to introduce new features to HTML. It allows us to new, introduce new features to CSS. It's trickier with JavaScript. That's why I worry when I see sites that make JavaScript the linchpin of getting at content now and for the future. It's putting that single point of failure at the most fragile part of the stack. JavaScript just isn't as robust because it's a programming language. I think inherently declarative languages are going to be a bit more robust than you know, procedural programmatic languages. So I'm saying just use progressive enhancement. Okay. When uh, Tim Berners-Lee was creating the World Wide Web at CERN, uh, how come William Lee was there uh, and he placed a bet that's how can William Lee is in co-creator of CSS, right? He placed a bet that HTML will be around for 50 years, which seemed ridiculous at the time because no format's going to last for 50 years. Uh, he since uh, updated, actually. He gave a talk in Oslo last week, and he said 500 years, uh, which is really pushing it. But I think, you know, 50 years, I, would, I, th I think he's right. I think it will be around. 
67.2 years is the average lifespan of a human being uh, on this planet. In this country, it's 80 years. So are we going to live longer than HTML? Are we going to live longer than other formats that we're currently putting online? Our memories. Uh, if your child has just been born, it's about 80 years life expectancy. They're probably longer by the time they grow up. But what's the life expectancy of those JPEG files that you're getting off your camera? What's the life expectancy of whatever movie format your device is taking? Binary formats in general, I'm not, not sure how long lasting they will be. Text formats, it gets a bit easier because they're human readable as well. So I'm glad we're putting a lot into HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But I think that error handling of HTML and CSS is actually more of a strength than JavaScript. And the, the design principles of HTML make me think that that's the longest lasting of, of the whole stack. 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. Imagine you were working on a project where the time scale was 10,000 years. You have to design something that was going to work for 10,000 years. There is such a project. It's the clock of the long now. There's the model that's in the science museum. This is a, a scale model because it's designed to be scale free. Uh, the actual clock is being built in Nevada, Mount Washington. Actually, there's a second site because Jeff Bezos has donated uh, a second site in, in West Texas. So two sites for the clock of the long now and geographic, geologically stable points. This is a clock that's going to tell time for 10 thousand years. It's got wonderful design principles. I urge you to read the design principles of that. Uh, from the Long Now Foundation, the same people who made longbets.org, same people who are making the salon of the Long Now. Uh, you know, there, there's actually even longer lasting projects than that. 24,100 years, give or take, is the half-life of plutonium-239. And of course, we're undertaking projects today that should be considering this time scale. How do you store something for that long? How do, you, how do you write a warning for the future, that far in the future, to tell people, keep away? You can't use language. You can't use English, any other form of written language. You can't even use iconography. Right? There was a think tank team to, came together trying to figure out what they were trying to say. They say, this place is a message. It's part of a system of messages. Pay attention to it. Sending this message was important to us. What, here is, what is here is dangerous and repulsive to us. This message is warning about danger. This place is not a place of honor. How do you communicate all of that without using words, without using iconography? They settled on using menacing earthworks to try and keep people away. There's an argument to be made you don't communicate anything at all because it's like building the pyramids. You're asking for grave robbers to come along and open it up. Long-term long -term thinking. But it's not the longest. You know, there's some design projects that have taken even longer timescales into consideration. The Voyager Golden Record. Carl Sagan, Andrew, and Frank Drake and the pioneer plaque before it. Uh, sounds from planet Earth, right? messages from planet Earth. Voyagers now heading into interstellar space. Maybe one day an alien civilization will come across it. How will they decode this? Right? These are the instructions to create a gramophone player. Digital technology existed at this time. This was 1977 when this got sent into space. But rather than encode it digitally, it was encoded in analog. Because it's a lot easier to give the instructions, here's how you build a gramophone record, than it is, here's how you build a computer. Right, before you then even begin to give the instructions. They have to have a unit of time, time itself. But it has to be universal. That's what this diagram is for. The transition of a hyperfine state of hydrogen should be the same everywhere in the universe. The trip back to the picnic on the lakefront will be a sped up version, reducing the distance to the Earth's surface by one power of 10 every two seconds. In each two seconds, we'll appear to cover 90% of the remaining distance back to Earth. Notice the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic. Ten to the ninth meters, ten to the eighth, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, 
One. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, 10 to the zero power. I had the great pleasure of uh, returning to CERN this year, not that long ago, with, uh, with Remy, with Brian, a bunch of smart geeks. We were working on this great project to try and recreate the line mode browser. It's one of the earliest web browsers, text-only web browser, over 20 years old. Try and recreate that in a modern browser. Brian and Remy did all the work, obviously. They're the smart guys. But it was a wonderful experience, right, being, being at CERN, being at the, the birthplace of the web. And, you know, I knew about the, the stuff that went on at CERN, and I knew, of course, it was the birthplace of the web, but getting to understand how CERN works was quite amazing, how it operates. It's like one big hack day. They're freed, they're freed from the constraints of, well, what's the business model, right? It's pure scientific research. And I think that, that influenced Tim Berners-Lee when he was creating the web. We got, we got shown around the uh, LHCB, one of the four experiments in the Large Hadron Collider, by this great, uh, uh, crazy professor uh, showing us around. Um, and uh, so the, the B stands for beauty. They're trying to detect the beauty quark, which appears in these uh, subatomic collisions that they create when they, they fire up the Large Hadron Collider and they, they create the coldest place in the universe to get that superconductivity and they smash these photons together. And I was asking, oh, so, so when these, these particles are, are emitted, um, how long do they exist for? What's the length of time that you've got to try and spot the particle? And he said, well, it's traveling at the speed of light, and it exists for, on average, uh, it travels about one centimeter. One centimeter. On average, actually at the most, somewhere between a millimeter and a centimeter, traveling at the speed of light, which I did some back-of-the-envelope uh, calculations, and that's my estimate for how long that is in terms of seconds. I'm not going to read out that number, but that's how far light could travel in one centimeter. It's amazing that they're working at these time scales. Of course, they don't work in seconds, they work in Planck time, right? Um, but just focusing on that pure science, what happened was that the web came out of it as a byproduct, right? The web, this amazing thing that we work on every day, it wasn't even the main thrust of their research. That was just something to help them collaborate because they were dealing with such big issues, fundamental issues, unencumbered by geographical boundaries, unencumbered by economics unencumbered by the usual things that, uh, 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 that, that stop cool stuff getting built, frankly, they created something like the web to help them collaborate. And that was definitely an influence on Tim Berners-Lee. I reread Weaving the Web after getting back from CERN, and very much that spirit of CERN, that hacked spirit informed it. And I want to make sure that the web isn't a fluke, right? That that spirit should inform what we do. Let's try and make that the norm. And we've been given this amazing planet-wide wide archive of knowledge with near real-time access. It's the best of both worlds, right? We need to think long-term. Think big picture. Think about off-site backup for planet Earth, right? Right now, all our data is on this one place, and the dinosaurs died out because they didn't have a space program, right? <laughs> I just want to finish by saying we should be thinking about our purpose. Uh, why we build what we build. I mean, you've got some people, they build stuff for fun, and we need those people, the people who push the boundaries of our technologies. You know, uh, Brendan Dawes and Sebley Delisle, these people creating, I guess it's art, but they're really pushing the boundaries. We need those people. And you've got the people like us, I guess. We do it for a living, right? Uh, maybe we do it for a paycheck. That's, I don't think that's the best motivation to do great work. But then we do it for the users. Okay, that's better no, uh, motivation, right? User-centered design and development. But there's a way to push it further, that we're doing it for the web. And why are we doing it for the web? Well, the web is good for our species, that the web is good for our planet, that the web is good for our future. So think long term, think big picture. And my time is up. <laughs> <laughs>